chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, the Apostle Paul says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then he tells us what the mind of Christ was. And he says that he, uh, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he lowered himself and he became obedient to the death of the cross. And... Um, so he gives us an instruction to uh, keep the mind of Christ ruling and controlling our thoughts because it's in you. It's been placed in you, but he's saying bring it, bring it forth, right? The mind of Christ. And he says this is what it was. If you're thinking this way, you're thinking like Christ. So he gives Christ... Sacrifice on the cross is how God thought. Now, someone needed to um, fill in the blank space. We think of, of sin as the most expensive thing in the whole universe, and so the greatest price was paid for it. And so this gap that sin left, this, this empty space that had to be filled, that Jesus Christ was thinking, I'll go down there and I will fill that space and I will redeem man with the sacrifice of my life and he's saying that is the mind that is in you but let that rule rule your thoughts and your behavior your decisions and so he gives Christ as the su supreme example of having that mind then he goes on a little further in this same chapter and he mentions a man in Christ who had the mind of Christ. And in verse 25, he mentions it. Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, companion in labor, and fellow soldier. So he mentions uh, three things here. The intimacy of being a brother, the intimacy of working together, and fighting together as a soldier he's a soldier so to have the mind of christ um, i have to think of you that way i have to think of you as my co-laborer all right we work together and i need to think of you as my intimate uh not only friend but my family jesus said my family are those who hear the word of god and keep it so uh when we say brother, sister, we're not just whistling Dixie. This is not a fine phrase. This is a fact. We're related by blood, the blood of Christ. There's no stronger blood than that. So he says, here's the mind of Christ. He says, I see you as my brother. He says, I, I see you as my companion. I see you as the, the guy who fights in the trenches with me. And that is he came down to be all those things to us so that we could become those things to him. So Epaphroditus, he mentions here, as an example of someone in the body that had the mind of Christ, and it was really letting, letting it come forth. So he says, uh, let's go back a little bit where we left off last week in verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, when I was a child, we used to watch this uh, TV sitcom called Dobie Gillis. Some of you remember, right? And they had this character, some of you are too young to remember Dobie Gillis. Okay, well that's good, good for you, okay? Uh, but uh, anyhow, they had this character, he was a beatnik, which was kind of a precursor to the hippie, right? 
And you know the philosophy of the hippies, you work for it and then I go into your garden and I eat it. You know, It's kind of a, a lazy philosophy of life, isn't it? You work and I enjoy, okay? But this character in, in the, the sitcom, Dobie Gillis, his name was Maynard G. Krebs, and he was a beatnik, and he pretty much introduced, he was the precursor to all hippies, okay? <laughs> he was the inspiration. And what would happen when he'd be at school or he'd be in any scene and somebody would mention the word work, he'd go, work? You know, and he'd just kind of jerk back and go, oh, that's a most horrible thought. Well, here's what I'm trying to tell you. That kind of Maynard G. Krebs mentality has crept into the church. In the teaching, you're saved by grace without works <laughs> has been perverted, hasn't it? So now he says work. He uses the word work, okay, <laughs> to uh, talk about in the mind of Christ. He was a working savior. He worked hard. And I want to you to know that this thing of working is very important to God. He says, uh, you are saved by faith, you are saved by the grace of God, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. <laughs> yes, good works. So don't think that doing good works in any way is interfering with your faith alone in the grace of Jesus Christ. So work as if no faith could save you, and have faith as if no work can save you. So, we are going to one day bring our works before the Lord. Those of us who have been saved by faith, you don't need works. We're going to bring our works before the Lord. Is this true? Does the Bible uphold this whole idea? You bet it does. Look at 1 Corinthians 13. It says your works are going to be brought before the Lord, and they're going to be tested by fire. Yikes. Whoa. It says he shall be saved, yet so as by fire. He will suffer a loss, but he himself will be saved. So we don't want none of that. We don't want to be suffering a loss, and yet I know and I humbly admit it to you, I humbly admit to you that my spiritual laziness is going to be something that when that day comes, I'm gonna wish. I'm gonna wish that I had worked. <clears throat> now, don't go on vacation with somebody who's going on a mission trip on a building trip and sit there and say, I came here for a vacation. Okay? If you're going on a mission trip with somebody who's going to be working, you might want to contribute. And we've had these Christians that come, well, I'm coming to Africa. I'm on vacation, right? And they're out there. Well, we're working there. <laughs> we're shoveling the cement. Anybody work for a cement crew here? Okay. <laughs> All right. Somebody knows how hard it is to shovel cement. In the heat of the hot sun of Africa, we're out there shoveling cement, right, around to make this uh, basketball court for the kids. And there's a brother over there, he's sitting over there, he's drinking iced tea, he's taking a nest tea plant. He said, I'm here on vacation. And we all jumped in pretty much tarred and feathered and ran him out of my room. No, just only in our thoughts. So if you're a hard working person and you love to work hard for the Lord, this is not in any way injuring your faith in the total grace of God to save you without works. Not in any way. In fact, it's only going to add to your reward. Now, a person that is in love with Jesus Christ is not comparing with other Christians what's their reward going to be. What's my reward going to be? As we know the story of Peter and John, and Peter says to Jesus, what about him, right? And Jesus says, don't you worry about him, you follow me. So this is not a, it's not a horse race. Who's working the hardest? It's not a thing for judgment. It's a thing that we personally see is something that's to our great advantage to labor for the Lord. Because the Lord came here 
and he worked hard at saving us. The Bible says, unto the blood. Let, let your struggle against sin, Hebrews says, be to the blood. That's a thought, isn't it? I don't work so hard. I'm going to get a blister. And it's going to bleed. That's how hard I'm going to work. Now, this character, Epaphroditus, was just such a type of person. And he kind of breaks the rule of more, most modern phrases that we have today. You know, hey, you need to take a vacation. Nothing against those who are coming. <laughs> no, no, nothing intended there. I'm still jealous. Of right, but, uh, but we have this phrase, you know, you, you need to take it easy on yourself. I don't know if Epaphroditus had the right counsel, okay? But he didn't get that. Take good care of yourself. Take it easy, all right? But look at, let's look here. In uh, <laughs> Epaphroditus, it says, <laughs> he says, he's a fellow soldier and a messenger. He's a messenger of God, and he is the one that ministered to my wants or needs, right? He was, a, hey, yeah, what Paul, Paul was a work, hard working Christian, wasn't he? And here Epaphroditus saw Paul and he said, say, I want to, I want to encourage that brother and I'm going to do everything in my power to keep Paul going. If he has a want or he has a need, I'm going to be right there. I'm going to be right there and say, how can I encourage you? How can I do something for you? Amen. Amen. That is the mind of God. Not leave me out of it. I'm going to take an SD plunge while you guys are working, okay? He says, He longed after you all. And he was full of heaviness because you heard that he'd been sick. He was grieved that you were feeling sorry for him. He didn't want you to feel sorry. Think about that. I don't want anybody to know I'm sick because I don't want them to feel bad. Now, I'm just the opposite of this. <laughs> if I'm sick, I want you to know about it. You know? I soak up the sympathy. But I'm no Epaphroditus, okay? I don't, I don't, I don't want to put my burden on somebody else. I want them to be happy. So you see how selfless this, this man was? very selfless. And we'll call that the mind of Christ. Now Paul's talking about having the mind of Christ, what Christ did, how Christ is our example, but then he's giving a human being just like you and me as an example of someone who had the mind of God. And he was a work. He was a worker. Now in every church you have three types. You have the shirkers, the jerkers and the workers, okay? And the shirkers, they're the types, you, you ask them to do something, and I've married a wife and I cannot come, okay? That's the type they are. Uh, and then there's the jerkers. They've always got a vision that you need to fulfill, that you need to work at, right? And they're going to they're gonna make participate in it, but they're kind of jerky about how they... How steady they are in it, right? They get you going, and then they go have an ST while you finish the job. Okay. We'll call them the jerkers. So you have the shirkers, the jerkers, and to, to a, a poem that's really good. And the workers. workers. The workers. Now, they've got their head down, and they're working for the Lord, and they're not keeping track of how much they do. They're not patting themselves on the back. They're just working for the Lord because they know it is such a privilege to work for Christ. And the more they can get of it, the more they want it. Because they're just working from love. Listen, you could speak with the tongues of men and of angels. But if you don't have love, you're nothing. And a real worker for Christ is somebody that's working with love in their heart. And... Obviously, without even saying it, we know Epaphroditus loved the church and he loved Paul, and that's why he got sick. 
It made him sick. Sick unto death, Paul says. So he was, you know, of course concerned. Now, this sickness, his thought was, oh no, this is going to make other people feel bad. That's an amazing mind, isn't it? For indeed, he was sick near, near unto death. Uh, Epaphroditus, stop, you're going to kill yourself. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I have should, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Listen, if Epaphroditus dies, Paul's not thinking, boy, we've lost a really good worker. He's thinking that he's losing the best of, of friend, of his best friend. He says, if I lose him, I'm just going to be free. I'll have sorrow upon sorrow. Now, I love when Paul says this. Because when you go to my funeral, please don't rejoice. <laughs> Somebody get sick to your stomach that you're so sad that I'm gone. I don't want some dry-eyed funeral and a bunch of people rejoicing that I went to heaven. I want you to be sad that I'm gone. And here's the evidence for it right here. Sorrow upon sorrow. Listen, it's great to grieve over a loss of a true friend. It's a natural process of life. And people say, oh, I don't want to enter into the, to that feeling of sadness. The Bible says it's better to be in the house of mourning than in the house of feasting. So please, no dry-eyed funeral. I got that from my dad. <laughs> You want to make jokes? Do it at somebody else's funeral, all right? <laughs> so, Paul wasn't ashamed of saying, I'm going to have sorrow upon sorrow if I lose a friend like Epaphroditus, a brother. That's the mind of God. So, Verse 28, I sent him therefore the more carefully that when you see him again, you may rejoice and that I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with gladness and hold such in reputation. Now Jesus made himself of no reputation and Epaphroditus was the same as Jesus. He wasn't doing this. So there we go. Oh, that Epaphroditus, what a worker. He wasn't doing it to heap on the praise of man, was he? He says, but Paul says, he's a great model for all of us. Hold him in reputation. Treat him with respect. He certainly earned it by his hard work. And I'm thankful for him because he's an example to me of not being a shirker or a jerker or a whiner. Here's a guy who didn't regard his own life because the gospel and the work of Christ was more important than his own life. Now, he mentions in other parts of scripture, there are those who put their very lives at risk for Christ. And they are a good example. He says, because for the work of Christ, he was near unto death, not regarding his life. Hey, Epaphroditus, watch out for yourself. Take care of yourself. Okay? He breaks the mold. He says, I don't care about my life. I just want to work to supply something that's much needed. And here's what it is. And here's the big pinch. Everybody ready to get pinched? not regarding his life to supply your lack of service ooh, ow, ooh, ouch toward me oh that was a very nicely done rebuke yeah. <laughs> and probably well deserved I'm afraid right now when you go out to do something for Christ where is everybody else 
Where's everybody else? You know, I'm kind of stuck out here on my own. Do you think for any one minute that that was the attitude Epaphroditus had? Yeah. Who's going with me? Where, where's the cheerleader section? How come everybody's not out here working? I'm out here working. That's not, it wasn't Epaphroditus' attitude. He had his head down and he was in love with Jesus and he was in love with the church and he wanted to do as much work as he could and he wasn't being careful about it, was he? Time to take a break, right? We don't want to get lost in good works. <laughs> it's tea time. <laughs> well, that's an interesting thought on Epaphroditus. Let's go back on, uh, we left off in verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only. Oh, Paul's here, so let's make it look good, okay? But now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Why do I need to do that? I'm saved without works. Works come because you're saved. Works are not going to save you. If you stand before God and he says, look, look what I did, you know. I went to Africa and, and we built a, uh, we went to Africa and, and we built a playground for the African children. And God will say, oh, that's what you're presenting is as I'm supposed to, you know, let everything go. Might as well just show them a filthy leprous rag and say, this is it, this is it, what I did. I got some merit badges, you know, God's going to have to take note of. That, that doesn't how it works, okay? I hope I can explain this. As Len always says, hopefully you're not more confused after I've explained it. I'm saying it. If I were to present the best part of my life, as far as what I've done, the Bible says in Isaiah, it would be considered a filthy rag compared to the righteousness of Christ. So in my hand, no, no price I bring. In my hand, no work I claim. Simply to your cross, I cling. That's our, our justification. But now, praise God, having been set free from the burden of work saving me. <laughs> and that is a big burden because none of us would make it in. But being set free from that, now we can go to work. We can tear it up. We can serve Christ and we don't have to worry about our life because he's going to take care of it. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Well, why would I need to do that? I'm saved by grace. Get to work. Maynard, okay? <laughs> we want to get rid of the spirit of Maynard G. Krebs in the church. We want to know that we're saved by faith without works. That's solid. I also want to be solid on the fact that I want to work for my Savior. And that's no way am I holding that up as a merit badge. You, you owe me now, God. You owe me now. Now, the apostles, when they were immature, hallelujah, they were constantly, what about what I'm doing over here? Maybe I should be sitting right next to the right hand of God when I get there. That's, what, that's where they were at at one time. Comparing themselves with one another. What about this one, Lord? What will he do? It's easy to do that, isn't it, when you're immature. Now, how do you recognize a baby Christian? He's competing with other baby Christians. He's bickering, probably, with other baby Christians. <clears throat> It's kind of a badge. It's a complaining spirit, and it's a spirit that demands and thinks that you're deserving. Listen, if you got exactly what you deserve, where do you think you'd be spending eternity? Okay, so 
I want God to reward me not according to what I do, but beyond. If you, if you take your talents and you use them, he said, I will do more than what you did. I will give you 10 cities. <laughs> I'm going to do the reward does not correspond to the effort. It goes way beyond the effort. That's God's economy. You've been faithful over a few things. Be ruler over many things. Now, this is the wrong attitude. Well, I want to rule over a lot when I get to heaven. Okay. I don't want to be ruling over 10 cities. I want to be ruling over 20 cities. Okay, that's, that's a wrong attitude. But these things are said to encourage us and to motivate us to understand that the reward is going to be of grace and not of debt. And a reward of grace is going to go beyond anything you may have earned by works. Just, just know that. So I don't have to be no, looking at what is my right hand producing, what is my left hand producing, uh -huh. right? When you give, don't let your right hand know what your left hand. Well, you know, I'm giving to a lot of charities. I just want you to know that. <laughs> Well, I think you get my drift. Just relax and rejoice in the work and know that God's going to reward you so beyond everything you, you, you've ever thought you, would, you could earn. But he says it to motivate us. Hear these words of Jesus now in the book of Matthew. Uh, This is, we call this uh, Bible 101, okay? Matthew chapter 5. Let's get started at the beginning. Bible living, Bible training, <laughs> the Gospel of Matthew. Let's just get right there at the Sermon on the Mount. And let's, let's get it straight. Let's get it straight in our head. Chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 10. Now, we've been out handing out tracts. We've been witnessing to people, whatever we're doing. We were feeding the poor, working on a, a basketball court in Africa. We've been out doing the work, okay? We're out there doing the work, okay? And here's what Jesus says. Verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Now I want to ask you a very personal question. Let's not see the show of hands, right? Has this ever happened to you? Just a solid moment here. For your righteousness, for your love for Christ. Has anybody ever called you a name or cast out your company or said, I don't want to sign up with you. I don't want to hook up. I don't even want to say hello to you. Have you ever been persecuted for righteousness sake? The Bible says all who live godly, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So if you've never been persecuted for righteousness sake, I suggest you live godly. Because there's no way you're going to live godly in this world and not get persecuted. Now, what, what attitude did the apostles have when they were persecuted for righteousness sake? They say, wow, we suffered for the name of Jesus. This is fantastic. They weren't running around saying, I got a great reward. I got a great reward. They weren't even thinking about it. But Jesus wants us to know something. And what is that? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Someday you're going to be in heaven. And you're going to own heaven with Christ. You're going to be an heir of God. An heir of Christ. An heir with Christ. And the Bible says, you own the kingdom of God. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You're going to be in heaven, and you will never, ever be persecuted for Christ ever again. Amen. It can only happen here in this present evil world where Christ isn't adored as he should be. He isn't honored. He isn't worshipped as he should be. 
Well, here's another one. Personal question. Blessed are you when men shall revile you. What are those people talking about? Who are they putting down over there? Some group of people going, what a jerk, right? Because you stood for Christ. You're blessed. And this is a blessing that doesn't last for a lifetime. This is an eternal blessing <laughs> that can never tarnish throughout all eternity. Blessed are you. Put a capital B on that blessed. Okay, mm. blessed are you. When that group is over there going, shit. When an eyebrow turns up and goes, oh, they're going off again. Okay, blessed are you. Now, this is no small thing here. God doesn't see it as a small thing. But look at, it says, they persecute you and they say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Well, I'm not going out trying to get people to say all manner of evil against me falsely. I would like to be, you know, applauded. Actually, you know, it's hard to get out of bed without turning on the applause machine. Okay, Jack Finney said. <laughs> right? I want to be loved. I want to be popular. I want to be liked. I want to fit in. In fact, I wouldn't mind showing off. I wouldn't mind standing out. But he says, for my sake, that didn't happen to you. You didn't fit in to the world. Blessed are you. Blessed are you. And how blessed? Well, let's take a good look. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. He it doesn't say go over there somewhere, lay down, you know, on your, your pity party lounge and, and say, woe is me. I'm so unpopular. They don't like me. I don't have any friends. Okay. Jesus said, you're blessed in a way you cannot even imagine. He says, for great is your reward in heaven. Now, something's great. Something is lesser. When Moses saw the people worshiping the golden calf after God had delivered them out of, the, out of Egypt, right? With, with his mighty hand. He said, you have sinned a great sin against the Lord. So that means there's something lesser if there's something great. Or else the word great has no meaning. Now, what's he say about being persecuted? For the name's sake of Jesus. All who live godly are going are gonna to suffer this. Great is your reward in heaven. Now, I'm not going to get something printed on my shirt. Guess what? Great is my reward in heaven. I got, I got put down for Jesus. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to keep track. I don't let my right hand know what my left hand's doing. I do not keep any track because I don't need to. Because God is watching from heaven. And he says, boy, I'm going to reward them greatly for that. And he tells us, he tells us to motivate us to work for Jesus. Well, what if I work too much for Jesus? <laughs> if Paphroditus didn't, he didn't, he didn't worry about that. Did he? Well, that's quite a verse. This, I call this Bible 101. Blessed are you when men will revile you, persecute you, the same manner, all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Anybody got any neighbors like that? Rejoice and be exceeding glad. He doesn't say to be glad. He says be exceeding glad. The Bible says that God loves us in John 3, 16. God so loved the world but then it also says that he gave. Well, how much does God love? <laughs> Ephesians says, Christ with his great love with which he loved us. So he not only loves you, he greatly loves you and he greatly wants to reward you. And I'll tell you, that, that motivates me 
not because I'm looking to outshine, right? Somebody else, but just to know that to see Christ and look him in the face and know that he says, well done, good and faithful servant is reward enough for me. First of all, it's more than I could ever earn or deserve no matter what I did. But he says he's going to say it. Do you believe that, brother? That when you look Christ in the face, he's going to say, well done, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And what a joy it's going to be. Incredible. And look who you're hanging around with. Verse 12. Rejoice and be exceeding glad rather than be sad. Be glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. I said to you, uh, Pastor Wormer, and I said, Pastor, I was sitting on his living room couch, and he was standing over me, and he had he had his hand on my shoulder, as he so often did. You, you couldn't talk with Pastor Wormer, where he didn't put his hand on your arm, he didn't touch you in some way, and he had his hand on my shoulder. I said, you know, Pastor, I was joking with him. I said, when we get to get when we get together in heaven, we're going to talk about what we went through together. And he, he didn't know where I was going with this, right? I said, I said we're going to talk about how you were tortured for Christ for 14 years in a communist prison and how I was down at the pier. And some guy threw a candy wrapper in my face and said, what an idiot, right? It, it, you know, we're, we're suffering brothers, right? And I was playing with him. And he, he, he grabbed me tighter and he said, when that man did that to you, he humiliated you, and that is no small suffering for Christ. Wow. So, who, who am I hanging out with? Who am I going to hang out with? All the prophets that were before me. Now, we're going to talk shop when we get to heaven. It's going to be great reminiscing about what we went through for Jesus' name's sake. That's who you're hanging out with. And if I don't have a great reward, I know a few people who do. So I just go hang out at their house. For one thing, I've been married to Lynn, okay? And I don't think she's going to tell me, no, you can't use my toilet. <laughs> Wait till we see Lynn's bathroom. <laughs> I'm really embarrassing her right now. She's having a birthday coming up, so don't miss it, okay? Oh, honey, I'm so sorry. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna get it. I can feel it. I feel the heat already. I'm gonna get it. Don't go off the grid, okay? Now we're gonna hang out with David, King David. Have you ever really entertained that thought? No. Uh, uh, David, you stood before Goliath. And I got candy wrappered at the pier. Okay, it's gonna be great. You say, I'm sorry, that guy. I'm sorry, that guy. Look down on you that day. He's gonna understand. He's gonna care about any suffering I've been through. But you know what? I'm gonna be able to talk to David about what it was like to say, "You uncircumcised Philistine, I'm gonna give your body to the birds today." Amen. That's gonna be a glorious moment. Who are you hanging out with yeah. when you're persecuted for Christ? All, all the prophets that were before you. This is your family. Epaphroditus, Paul, King David, Job. You're going to see them all in person. And we're going to talk shop about how we were persecuted. Because everything, your neighbor who mistreats you every single thing god is keeping a record of it and you know what it's earning for you a great reward my, my uncle russell when i met my uncle russell at the family reunion he said to me dave he says you're an idea you're an idea man he said i like you and he says your your name is going to be enlightened because you're an idea man. 
And I thought to him, I didn't say because I didn't want to sound prideful. I said, my name is already written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. And that Jesus said, that's better than telling demons to go back to hell. Rejoice rather that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I am not looking pretty any Vegas right thing. Dave Bocaro is doing his new comedy sketch or he's going to be doing a dance or playing his favorite guitar song. I'm not looking for that. I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for my name really being in lights. <laughs> right up there with Moses and Abraham. <clears throat> wow. We have no idea what Jesus means when he says, great is your reward in heaven. We have no idea. Jesus said, you're of more value than many sparrows. Is that the most understated thing in the whole world? Not even a sparrow can fall to the ground without your father, he said. Fear not, little flock. You're of more value than many sparrows. Oh, man. He has to understate it because there's no way that we can comprehend how great it is going to be when Jesus, who sees in secret, <coughs> will reward you openly. Look at this Epaphroditus. He's in the Bible. He's in the Bible. He's in Philippians. And Paul, the great apostle Paul says, look at him. And model him and hold him in reputation. All I can say to that is, wow. And you know what? It wasn't using I'm saved by grace as an excuse not to work, was he? Yeah. You know, if you want to be intimate with somebody, Work with him. Work with him. You know, this is a great thing. You know, he goes over, he says, I'm going to minister to the Apostle Paul. No, I, I want to be Apostle Paul's friend so, so I can, you know, say, hey, I'm the Apostle Paul's friend. He didn't worry about that. He went over and said, what is your, where do you need service, Paul? That's all he thought about. If you want to be close to somebody, serve them. Supply to them the lack of service. That's such a beautiful thought. He almost died doing your job too. It's quite a thought. That's quite a thought. Well, I want to be like the Epaphroditus or however you say it. I want to be like him. I want to be like Paul. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like Richard Werbrand, but I'm not great enough to be like them. So I'll just be me. And forget about what God's going to give them and start thinking about how I can put myself under somebody. Under somebody and serve them. You know, the greatest thing that you can be is a caregiver. He was a caregiver for the Apostle Paul. And you know, God sees that. He sees you cleaning up that area. He sees you humbling yourself. He sees you ministering to the poor and the feeble. God sees all those things. And let me tell you something. Great is your reward in heaven. You have no idea. <coughs> because it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Christ is going to be glorified for everything that Christ has done. He's worthy, right? There was no one found worthy in the whole book of Revelation until the Lamb came. And he was found <coughs> worthy. But I tell you, the one who was found worthy humbled himself and became obedient even to the death of the cross. And Jesus is going to be so glorified in heaven, but that's not what he's thinking about. I go to prepare a place for you. Well, Lord, you made the world in six days. All, the universe, 
You spread out the stars, Lord. It's six days. It's been more than 2,000 years since he said, I go to prepare a place for you. Don't ever think because you're saved by faith that you don't, you don't need to work for Jesus. Oh, absolutely. The fire will try every man's work. It's right there in 1 Corinthians 3. That's not a remote place. Okay. The fire will try every man's work of what sort it is, whether it's wood, hay, or stubble, which is going to be a loss, or gold, precious stones. Build upon that foundation, Paul says. But be careful how you build because what you're building is for all eternity. Now, Proverbs says this. The fruit of righteousness is a tree of life. And where do I get my righteousness from? Same place you do. Clothed in robes of righteousness. The fruit of righteousness is a tree of life. But he that wins souls is wise. The book of James says, he that converts a sinner... From the error of his way shall cover a multitude of sins. So I know where I, I want to put my work. I want, to, I want to put my energy and my work upon the grandest object that I could work on. And that's conversion. Conversion of a sinner. Because he who converts a sinner from the error of his way shall save a mult shall uh, save a soul from death and shall cover a multitude of sins is he talking about the sinner's sins <laughs> could be or mine could be i don't care either way i just want to save jesus blood i want to see it wash and be poured over i don't want the cross of my lord to do anything less than what it was meant to do and not, his word's not going to return void. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert sinners from the error of their way. I'm going to put my work upon the grandest object upon which I can bestow it. Because I want to see the blood of Jesus effective change people's lives. You know, yesterday I was so blessed. I was choked, I was choked up. I was choked up. I, I came... Uh, they said they were having a testimony time with the young people and Jonathan asked me if I would come in and listen to the testimonies <sighs> and this group called Crew Campus Crusade right they go to the high schools and they give away free pizza but they have an ulterior motive <laughs> and these kids who don't want anything to do with church. Maybe they've been soured, soured on religianity. Okay, maybe they've been soured. Maybe somebody who said they were Christian, maybe a parent who said they were Christian abused them. Maybe an uncle who said they were a Christian <coughs> abused them. And so they may be soured them. But here they are, they're hungry. And uh, they, they want some pizza and the pizza is free. And come into my my parlor said the spider to the fly come and get some pizza but they eat the pizza and then they the people begin to introduce them to the love of Jesus Christ they begin to love them like Christ loved them and and they start telling their story of how God caused them to realize that they were loved and the story you go I don't know how you, you ever realized that God loved you you had such a terrible beginning. But it says, when the grace of God appeared to them, they discovered Christ's love. Their whole life was changed. Amen. Their whole life, their whole attitude about God and about other people. And they're miraculously healed of every bitterness that they've had toward their family. So what they do is they pray for their families. Still praying for their families. And you know, as I was listening to these young people tell these, these testimonies, I had a knot in my throat the whole time. <clears throat> that's God's love. It's something that's not revealed by life. It's revealed 
by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I just am blessed by free pizza. Maybe you've been a free pizza kind of guy, kind of gal, right? And you're doing something for Christ and you think it's of no significance. Guess again. The Bible says, great is your reward in heaven. Well, the one who said you're of more value than many sparrows also thinks you're great. And he's going to reward you greatly. And he wants you to know that to encourage your heart. Let's close in prayer and get to work. Okay. Well, it's about time to go back to work. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you today. We look at this man, Epaphroditus, and we hold him in high esteem, Father. Lord, there's so many others that we can think of today. And you have made us part of that family, God. And if, if all we we do is take a candy wrapper in the face, Lord, you don't forget one thing. Not even a sparrow can fall on the ground without you noticing, without you caring, without you having compassion. You see everything that we do. You, you see the patience that we have with our neighbors, Lord. We want to pray in our neighbor. But, Lord, you give us the patience to pray for our neighbor. And, God... All these things, all these works are going to come before you one day and the fire will reveal it, the Bible says. Oh God, we just love you today and making us part of this great and high calling. Lord, when, when somebody told us God loves you and has a plan for your life, they understated it, God. <laughs> we have a high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So, Father, give us enthusiasm, Lord. <laughs> Fill us up today with a spirit, a working spirit, God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God.